Okay. Um, so what we've what we've learned so far in chapter five is that we're we're trying to solve this area problem. And what that leads to is this sort of discussion and theory about more than just area, right? Somehow adding up these rectangles when we look at a function between two endpoints. And so we, we describe that process now in something a little bit more general than area. We have what's called the, the definite integral. So the definite integral here is going to look like a to b f of x dx. And the definition of what that actually is, is our limit of the sums of the f of x of i's times the delta x. So this is actually what that definite integral symbol means. Um, but what we can do here is, is look at this and that symbol and imagine this process of adding up the rectangles, which is giving us this signed area, right? So remember this would count as a positive and this would be a negative and this would be a positive. This operator as well as this operation would add all of that together and give me a value. Right, so the definite integral here is a value. Um, what we want to do really is come up with a better way of evaluating and working with this definite integral. And the reason for that is that this process is challenging. Um, even when you have a pretty simple polynomial, it's challenging and that's really all we're able to do. If I threw in an exponential or a trig function, all of a sudden we wouldn't have the tools to solve that and come up with, with a valid expression, um, something that we could take the limit of. And part of that's because of the summation tool, right? That summation tool is, is, is a little limiting for us. So we wanna come up with a better way of, of working with this definite integral. And the way to do that for us is that we are going to define something called an accumulation function. Oops. Accumulation function. So um, for this accumulation function, we're going to call it um, to keep our variables straight. What we're going to do is we're going to say if we start with a function f of t, so rather than using x here, I'm just using t so that I don't get it mixed up with x. And I start at some point here, a. An accumulation function is gonna kind of gather up the area between a and some upper bound. And what I want is I want that upper bound to be able to change, so I'm gonna call that x. So I'm imagining that A is fixed and that X is something variable. So we're going to define that by using our notation here. So we're integrating from A to X, but X we're thinking of as changing. And if I change X, I get different amounts of area. So this is really a function. This whole expression is a function of x. So I'm going to call that g of x. So g of x is going to be the integral from a to x of f of t dt. So even though we're used to thinking of f of t as a function, and it is, right, the outputs or the y values are changing with respect to t, um, the thing that's varying here is not that it's the it's the x the upper bound okay. so one second here okay
So um, let's look at an example here. Let's let f of t equal um, 2t plus 1. That's a line like this. Um, when t equals like minus a half, it's there, right? So, um, Let's try and find g of x. So g of x, this is our accumulation function. g of x should give me the area under this curve for any value of x. And I'm going to start with 0. So notice what happens here is if I go over to 1, f of 1 is 3. So I can break this up. I can find this area using geometry, right? And I can tell you that this area is 1. This is 1 by 2. So this area is also 1. So. If I look at the area from 0 to 1, that's going to be 2. If I want to find the area from 0 to 2, I would do the same thing. In this case, I would have a rectangle that is 2 units wide by 1 unit high. So that'd be 2. And then I would have a triangle that's 2 units on the base. Here at 2, this is, this is going to be up at 5. So this is going to be 4 units. 2 units by 4 units times a half is going to be 4. So 2 plus 4 is 6. So this is a function, right? This function, if I give you different inputs, that's this upper bound. And I can use that to calculate what the area is. And just like a function, I put in a different input, it spits out a different output. But this, this function has, um, well, it has some kind of special properties about it. Um, namely, what its derivative is and how its derivative connects to this original function. So if I, if I go back and look more carefully at how I'm actually constructing these areas, This is my x value, right? This upper bound. Since the function is 2t plus 1, this whole height here is going to be 2x plus 1. And this value here is fixed at 1. So if I subtract that from there, this value is going to be 2x. Right? This whole thing is 2x plus 1. So this is 2x and this is 1. So what I can do here is for any x, I can figure out what the area is. This box at the bottom is going to be x. So the area is going to be x plus, this is a triangle, so it's going to be 1 half. x is this dimension, right? This is 2x. So g of x is going to be x plus x squared. So that's the area for any x. And we can test that. We can, we can test it with our thing here. When I put in 1, I get 1 plus 1 squared, which is certainly 2. When I put in 2, I get 2 plus 2 squared, so 2 plus 4, which is 6. So this looks good. This function is matching with that. Here is the interesting fact. 
what is the derivative of this accumulation function g of x? Well, this is no problem. Derivative of x is one and derivative of x squared is two x. And what do you notice about derivative of the accumulation function when you compare it to the original function? The original function here is 2t plus 1. And notice its derivative is almost the same. I've ended up replacing the t with the x. But the, the function, the relationship, is exactly the same as what I started. So this area function, the g, is some function whose derivative is f. And we've talked about this, it's been a week perhaps, right? But when you have a function whose derivative is f, that function is called the antiderivative of f. So all of a sudden, there appears to be some sort of connection between area and the function and the derivative. So let's explore that connection a little bit. And I'll write down what I just said here. If g of x is the accumulation function, of f of t from a to x. Then g prime of x is equal to f of x, which implies that g of x is an antiderivative of f of x. So that's what we tried to demonstrate or show with that last little example. I don't know that that would convince you as in terms of a proof, but it, it certainly seemed like we could get that to work out for that one little example. But there's some relationship here between these two functions. Um, What this leads to, I think we can jump right into it, is what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And it's, it's basically the same statement, just made more formally. Okay. So we're going to let f of t be continuous on some interval. So we, we want to work with a continuous function here. And let g of x equal this accumulation function. So we'll say a to x of f of t dt. So rather than just calling it like Well, just the accumulation function, we're going to define it in terms of a definite interval. But that's the same thing that we are doing visually, right? It's just finding the area between a and x under this function f of t dt. So we, if we have a continuous function and we define g of x to be this area function, then g prime of x is continuous. Sorry, let me not say, I just need g here. Then g of x is continuous and differentiable. That's not always entirely clear that you, you have always, if you start with a continuous function, you find its area, that its area function is going to be continuous and differentiable. But it is. And, and this is the most important point, g prime of x is equal to f of x which is exactly what I've stated up above. 
And exactly what we were trying to illustrate with a specific example just before this. Now, it may not seem at the moment that that's all that impressive or interesting, but it turns out to have some very powerful consequences. If we have a continuous function, and we look at its area function, then when you take the derivative of that area function, you get back the original. This implies that g of x is an antiderivative of f of x. Okay, are there, are there questions about this? may be hard to ask a question it's a hard excuse me it's a hard concept to like what is it really saying right you can you can read the words it's not really that complicated of a statement to be honest we've seen much more complicated things in our course but what it's really trying to communicate is is harder to grasp um Another way of looking at it is that the rate of change of the area function, so remember g of x is like the thing that gathering up area, how fast you gain area, the derivative, is equal to the height of the function at that point. And that's a, a visual way of looking at it. Right? Like I'm gathering up area as I look at g of x, right? G of as x gets bigger, I get a little bit more area. So how much more area do I get as x gets a little bit bigger? Well, it's it's related, turns out to be equal to the height of the function, right? If the function is very low at that point, then of course I wouldn't gather up very much area right, by changing x. When the function's taller at that point, I gain a lot of area. So the rate at which I gain area, it turns out to be equal to the height of the function. Okay. Um, that's another way of looking at what this theorem is saying. Let's let g of x equal the integral from 2 to x of the square root of the sine of t. Let me make this sine squared of t plus 1 dt. I want to make sure what's inside is positive, or else I'll have the square root of the negative number, which should be a problem. This is a function. One way to look at this is this is a new kind of function, right? We've seen trig functions and we've seen polynomial functions and we've seen exponential functions and we know how to find all of their derivatives, right? And we've combined all those functions with compositions and multiplication and division and we found their derivatives, right? We've seen inverse trig functions and we've found their derivatives. Any function that, that we've seen, we've learned how to find its derivative. So this is a new type of function, right? It's an accumulation function. And what this fundamental theorem is telling us is really how to find its derivative, right? And if we know the derivative, then we know a lot about the function, right? We know the shape of it. We know the concavity of it. We know all of this stuff if we know its derivative. It's mins and maxes. So anytime I see a function, it's an x, I want to know what its derivative is. Remember, if g is the integral from a to x of f of t dt, then the derivative is just f of x. So the idea is that this is somehow an antiderivative. g of x is an antiderivative of f. This is my function f right in here. 
So the derivative of g is going to give me just my function, but evaluated at x instead of t. It doesn't say take the derivative of the inside, not at all. It says the derivative is just whatever that inside function is. This area function is what's this is what is uh, I want to say functioning again, right? But what's um, being used as an antiderivative. So the derivative, in effect, is undoing that area function, that antiderivative, right? And getting us back to um, our original function, whatever that might be. And that's what this example is showing. And this is, um, I wasn't maybe at all clear of this in the beginning, but this is actually the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one. Are there questions about that example? Okay. Keep going here until we get some questions. Let's try this one. What about if instead of going from two to x, what if I put in um, x cubed? And again, the question is the derivative of that. Well, you certainly want to know, notice that there's a relationship between these two functions, right? They're very similar to one another, in fact. But instead of going to x, here it's x cubed. Let me just give you a little bit of a reminder over here. Find some space. What's the derivative with respect to x of the sine of x cubed? Well, hopefully we still remember our rules, right? I know the derivative of the sine of x, which is cosine of x. But instead of x, I put in x cubed, and then I multiply it by 3x squared, right? And we call that the chain rule. That's the process for taking the derivative when I have a composition of two functions, or where I know the derivative of one function, and when I replace that x with a new function, like x cubed, right, this is how the derivative works. Well, I knew the derivative of this when it was just x, 2 to x. It would be sine squared of x plus 1. But instead of x, I'm going to replace that with x cubed. And then I'm going to multiply by the derivative, which is 3x squared. This is just an application of the chain rule, but it certainly does cause students trouble sometimes because I think this new derivative rule is hard to process. So adding the chain rule to that sometimes feels um, it's hard to see maybe in the beginning what's going on. It, it's also tricky when you um, can see kind of what's happening without having to think too much about it, right? Like right here, you, you're like, maybe some of you are thinking, well, all he did was get rid of the symbol on the outside in this dt and replace the t with an x. That is true. Um, However, that's certainly, uh, there's some substantial mathematical reasons why we're doing that, right? It's not as trivial as it looks. Um, so in that sense, I almost think this is too easy, right? In that it, it, 
it um you can do it without thinking and so it becomes hard when you actually have to to maybe think about it any questions now There are some kind of variations on this issue. Um, like if I go x to two of um, the sine of e to the x, sorry, dt, e to the t, dt. So here, what you want to notice is, oh, the, the x is in the bottom, but it really should be in the top. Um, hopefully you remember from our rules on Tuesday that you can fix that by just making it a negative. So this is equal to this. And now that I can find the derivative of the derivative of this is going to be the sine of e to the x. There's no chain rule here because the X is just an X. Don't get fooled by the composition of the function, the F of T inside. That really, you can put any function you want in there. It does have to be continuous. But as long as it's continuous, which is a pretty low bar, um, what matters here are the bounds because that's what's varying. The function is like a fixed curve that's stuck out there, the F of T. The X is the, the bound, right? How far am I finding the area here? And so that derivative, right, of that area function is just the height of the original function, sine of E of X. Um, the derivative is removing the definite interval. Now, after doing a couple of these, I always like to throw in this kind of example. So think for a second, or maybe even write it down. What is the derivative here? Now, if you started writing down something like x cubed minus 4x plus 5, I know exactly what you're thinking, but you're not correct. This function does not depend on x at all. Whatever you put in for x, this is still a definite integral from 2 to 7. This is the area between 2 and 7 of this cube minus 4t plus 5, whatever that area is. Every x I put in, I still get exactly the same area. So this expression on the right, it turns out, is actually a constant. I don't know what exactly it is, and I don't care for this problem, but it's some fixed value. So when I take its derivative, I'm going to get 0. It's not changing. So you see the difference between this one and that one, right? It's small but critical. Here, the bound is changing. Therefore, its derivative is needs to change as well. Questions about that?
Now, some of this is a little bit like, okay, maybe you feel like you've got it, or maybe you're not sure yet, but you can imagine you might figure out how to do these derivatives. Um, and that, of course, is wonderful, but you know, I no one cared about this kind of function beforehand. So finding its derivative, while it tells us a lot about the original function, um, maybe doesn't seem that important, right? Like, okay, found a new derivative. I'll add it to my whole list of all the other derivatives. But there's much more to it than that. And, and I'm gonna illustrate that here with part two. So, sorry, fundamental theorem part two. Fundamental theorem of calculus part two. And here's what it says. It deals with this definite integral situation where it's fixed. It says um, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. We don't have to worry about x's and t's here because the bounds here are fixed. So we just let everything be an x is equal to capital F of B minus capital F of A, where capital F of X is any antiderivative of F of X. And I should also say F of X must be continuous. I should have said that first, but I was so eager to share this with you. Now, this all of a sudden hopefully feels like something useful um, because remember what this is. This is the definite integral. We talked about in the beginning of class what the definite integral is, right? The definite integral is the limit of these sums. And I talked about how challenging that is Even when you have a simple function like x cubed plus three, right? that, this is a hard problem, right? It involves all those steps with um, the x of i's and the delta x and putting it all together and using the sigmas and then using the limits and then hopefully getting the right answer in the end and then you know, checking it. And that was just for a polynomial function. What this says, fundamental theorem says, I don't need to do anything with limits or sums or f of x of i's or delta x's or anything. It says I can find the value of the definite integral by just finding an antiderivative, capital F of x, and evaluating the capital F of x at b minus capital F of a. That's, I mean, I don't want to say amazing, but it is totally amazing. Right, that's 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 awesome, right? Because it's it's not only saving us a lot of work. We don't shy away from work when we can do it, but it's it's giving us the possibility of all kinds of other functions that I would have no idea how to do a, with this limit and sum business. And instead, saying all I have to do is find an antiderivative. We were already getting pretty good at antiderivatives when we practiced them back at the end of, of chapter four. Um, I do want to show you a little bit why this is true, because partly because it is so, um, like, kind of why? Like, why should the antiderivative have anything to do with this problem that we were working on? Um, well, it's precisely because if we set this up as an accumulation function, so there's a little proof. I haven't done too many proofs in our, our live sessions here. If I let g of x equal a to x, um, f of t dt. So I'll go back to the t's here because, sorry, I said a to x. I know that I wrote a to b. So let's start with our accumulation function that we used in part one. And let, um, let me say capital F of X 
equal any, any anti derivative of little f of x. By the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, we know g of x is an antiderivative of, again, I know I'm, I'm sort of blending my f of t's and f of x's here, but it, it is okay in this situation or it will work out. G of X is an antiderivative. That's exactly what the fundamental theorem says, right? When I take the derivative of this, I get back F of X. So it's an antiderivative of F of X. And if I take any other antiderivative of F of X, I know those two things have to be equal by just a constant. So G of X has to equal F of X plus C. So these two things imply, right? They have to be the same function except maybe a constant. So let's take a look at f of b minus f of a. Well, I can I can move this constant over. Maybe I should have defined it the other way, right? But I can move this constant over, make f of whatever equal to g of that minus c. So f of b minus f of a is going to be g of b minus c minus g of a minus c. Right? That's just from because f and g are equal except for a constant, so I can replace f of b with g of b. And you can see here the c's cancel, right? And that's why the constant and which particular derivative it is doesn't, antiderivative is, doesn't matter because I'm gonna add or subtract the c here, then I'm gonna do the opposite over here. So those are gonna cancel. And I end up with g of b minus g of a. But of course, g is the integral from a to x. So g of a is the integral from a to a, that's zero. And g of b is the integral from a to b. And that's exactly what we claimed in this, in this proof. Um, I'm sure that feels a little bit like hand wavy, like, okay, what does that really, what did that really do? Um, how did you do that? I, I sort of explained each step, but in the end, the result is, is still a little bit of a surprise. Um, but what's important there is that it relies really totally just on this fundamental theorem part one. If you, if you know that this is really an antiderivative, um, then it turns out that all you need to do is, is evaluate this antiderivative at the start and at the end to see what the, what the area is, what the function is. Um, maybe to make this stick a little bit or feel a little better, let's just see a couple quick examples here using our, our new superpower. So we'll start easy. The integral from one to three of x squared dx. Now again, maybe you haven't done too much of 5.2 yet. If you have, you, you do need to know how to use the definition of the derivative. And you can do this one using the definition of the derivative. That's the limit and the sums. And you probably will have to do some like this using the definition of the derivative. And after you do a bunch of those, you will really appreciate using the fundamental theorem of calculus because it is so much faster and easier. Um, this is equal to, I need to find an antiderivative of x squared. Well, remember our rule there, right? We add one to the exponent and divide by that exponent. 
And now I would have to add a C, right, plus C. But my rule said I could use any antiderivative I want. So I'm going to choose the one where the C is zero. That's always the easiest one to use. There's no need to put a C in here because it's just going to get subtracted and added together and cancel out anyway. So I'm always going to pick the antiderivative that has no constant since I get to pick whatever one I want. And now I still, what my rule says, I have to evaluate this. This is my capital F of X right here. I have to evaluate it at three and then subtract that value at one. And so the way we like to write that is, is it really is a two-step process. I got to figure out the antiderivative and then I've got to evaluate it. So we use this kind of vertical bar to represent that this is my function and then these are the two spots I'm going to evaluate it. Right, I found the antiderivative, so I don't want to use this symbol anymore because that's kind of implying that I'm taking the antiderivative and that I don't need to do that anymore. So we use this vertical bar. So this is going to be three cubed over three minus one cubed over three. It's 27 over three, which is nine minus one third. Uh, 26 thirds. The only challenging part here is the antiderivative. All of this is just plugging the numbers into the function. There is literally nothing more to it than that. Um, but finding the antiderivative, as we know a little bit, is is easy for some functions, but it can be very hard. For other functions, sometimes even impossible for other functions. So it's, it's not a, a silver bullet per se, but it is certainly a, a really powerful tool. Um, and so um, let me give you one more example and then I'll conclude things here. Let's go from zero to two of um, e to the x plus x squared minus five. Well, our rule, our fundamental theorem here says I need to find an antiderivative. I can do this in stages. So e to the x becomes e to the x. x squared, I already did that one. And minus 5 has to be minus 5x. So there's still like a little bit of kind of work here. I mean, I have to plug in the values and be careful I get the right answers. When I put in two, I get e squared plus eight thirds minus 10. When I have multiple terms here, I need to make sure I'm subtracting the whole thing. e to the zero plus zero minus zero. Now remember, e to the zero is one. So this is minus one and I end up with e squared plus eight thirds minus this extra one minus 11. What is that minus 33 thirds so that's minus 25 thirds. I become less interested in the problem right once we get to this point it's just adding numbers together. Right, the calculus is happening here and here. This is amazing. This is giving us the area under this function. This is a somewhat complicated function. I mean, I don't know what that looks like. It's some kind of curve. It's got an x squared and an exponential in it. But I was able to calculate the exact area exact, not an estimate, but the exact area under this curve from zero to two in, you know, 
20 seconds. This is a powerful tool. This is answering um, some, some questions that we didn't know we could answer right, until we had this. The fundamental theorem of calculus. Questions? Okay, so just in summary, I know I've written this down before, but I will do it again. The limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals one to n of f of x of i times delta x is this definition of the definite interval. Let me get a red pen for emphasis. We can also interpret this as area. Right. And we know that can be positive or that can be negative. And then finally, we can also calculate it using fundamental theorem of calculus. All three of these are going to be very important for your understanding of our work and moving forward exams, quizzes, work. Okay. Um, I want you to be able to calculate this using each of these three methods um, for certain types of problems. These and these were limited and can only do fairly simple things. It's fine. Um, these, we can do anything that we can find the antiderivative of, which is we're also a little limited there, right? There's not a lot. We will get better at that by the end of chapter five. But here in the beginning, um, you know, we, we can find some basic antiderivatives like we did here. More complicated things. We, we don't have that yet, but we will continue to work on that. The sort of magic of calculus is that all three of these are connected and in a sense then they are all connected to the derivative right because this is relying on the antiderivative um, and that's really I always feel like that's an amazing thing to get to that point. Um, we've spent so much time learning about limits and learning about the derivative. And then to see that there's a connection here to this other problem that to me feels very unrelated um, is, is kind of cool. I think it's cool. Um, I do, I am a teacher, so I guess I'm, I'm biased, but maybe at least you can feel like it's at least a little bit um, cool to, to see that, right? Or get a taste of that. This is not something that you're gonna like grasp intuitively immediately or maybe you are but you'll be much smarter than i am if that's the case i've taught this many many years and i'm still learning and um connecting these parts together right so um it, it don't worry if you don't feel confident right at this point we've just seen it it's going to take us some time and even by the end of the course um you won't have mastered this this relationship, but you'll be on your way.
Okay. Um, with that said, I will let you go. You, you don't actually need this for 5.2. This is from 5.3. Um, and the, the 5.2 homework is the one that's due on Friday. But you'll want to get started on the 5.3. I believe that's due on Tuesday next week, right? So you don't want to save that or wait until our class on Tuesday to get started with that, right? We want to get started on that now or over the weekend. Um, so you can ask some questions as needed. So, I think, yes, that is what I have for you.